my name is Cheryl Shearer and I serve on the committee. And uh, we have had a great time putting this together. This uh, presentation is being recorded and will be available for you at a later date. We'll, we'll let you know when that will happen. However, I do want you to know, I think this is great, Leslie has agreed that you can share her presentation with folks that may not have been able to attend. And I think it's gonna be some good stuff that you'll be uh, very fortunate to be able to share. We are really fortunate that Leslie is uh, available to do this presentation, although that she lives in Wyoming. However, she's in Tucson for a few weeks now and studying and learning more about interactions between mountain lions and the bighorn sheep. Wildlife and plants are Leslie's passion. She's a trained horticulturist and designer. She's a naturalist, writer, and researcher who hopes to raise awareness about the harsh realities of habitat and land fragmentation and the impact that it has on the survival of wildlife. Her book, Ghost Walker, uh, chronicles her experiences as putting out trail cameras and tracking mountain lions, as well as the extensive interviews that she's conducted with biologists, trackers, houndsmen, and conservationists. Together, she puts this together in a way that reveals the true nature of this very secretive, elusive, and magnificent uh, creature that lives in Savino Canyon. Leslie, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to your presentation, and please unmute. Thanks, Cheryl, and I would just Thank you all for coming. We're Sabino Canyon Naturalists for coming to my presentation. So I wanted to begin with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so first of all, uh, there's a lot of names for cougars, probably over 25 or 30 names. And the reason for this is that cougars are probably the most successful large mammal in the Americas. So their uh, natal range was all the way from around the Yukon down to the tip of South America and from the West Coast to the East Coast of North and South America, except they've been extirpated from uh, North America west of the Rocky, excuse me, east of the Rocky Mountains. So that's why there's so many names in there that you see. Some of them you probably recognize, uh, obviously cougar and mountain lion, huma, uh, panther is usually um, a name that's given to cougars in Florida, but they're the same animal. So I didn't start out to actually write a book, um, but I'm going to bring you to the end of my journey once I finished my manuscript. So in doing all my research, um, one of the things I found, and I thought I'd start with this in the Southwest, even though I live in Wyoming, is in Bandelier National Monument, there's a very unique um, uh, kind of, not a petroglyph, not a pictograph, uh, but basically kind of like a sculpture of um, two mountain lions that are recumbent. And they're over a thousand years old. And the Park Service basically keeps it secret where they are because uh, the native peoples in the area still go there to do ceremony and it, those are sacred to them. There's a little village that's, of course, a thousand years old, unoccupied next to it. And it's a, a long and remote hike. So it was kind of like after I finished my manuscript, kind of to pay respects um, to the cat, I decided I was going to do this hike and there's no water. So you kind of have to, it's about 13 miles round trip, two or three very large canyons you have to cross. And when you get there, you see, um, you can sort of see from the, uh, the picture I have here, there's a, there's a doorway that faces east and uh, all these large stones that are around this circle and inside that circle are these two recumbent lions that are carved there. And they think that maybe they were, uh, that the town nearby used that as uh, a hunting uh, kind of site to uh, give honor to because lions were considered the perfect predator, perfect hunters. And some people think, and um, you can see, here's one, you can kind of see the long tail. It's kind of hard to see because they're at least over a thousand years old. 
Some people think that maybe one of them was a jaguar and one of them was um, a mountain lion. So back to the beginning of my story and how I got started on this. Um, so I'm a novice tracker. I moved um, from the Bay Area where basically I, I lived most of my life to Wyoming. And uh, I did tracking when I was in the Bay Area. But when I moved to Wyoming, um, we have the perfect substrate there, which is snow. And uh, I began going out kind of my first winter there, which was probably about 15 years ago. And uh, immediately I started seeing bobcat tracks in a certain area. So I thought, well, I'm going to I'm gonna go out every couple of days, particularly after a nice snow and look for these bobcat tracks and see what this bobcat's doing here. And then one day I went out and uh, I saw tracks that looked like a bobcat, but they were not. And the way I knew that they weren't bobcat is they were a lot bigger than bobcat tracks. Um, so they were mountain lion tracks. And when I saw these tracks and interestingly enough, they were in the same area as my bobcat but when I saw the tracks, um, I knew, kind of took my breath away and uh, raised the hair on the nape of my neck. And I knew I was in the presence of a perfect predator and uh, wanted to start tracking these predators instead of my little bobcat. And uh, kind of forgot about bobcats and began tracking mountain lions. And, um, you know, I didn't know a lot about mountain lions at the time. And actually, the, I got the couple books that were out there. Mostly they were huge books written uh, for uh, scientists. Of, um, so they, were, they weren't so easy to read. But um, I was really lucky that um, because I live right next to Yellowstone Park, then in 2012, the park had their, uh, in the winter, they have uh, classes there in the summer, but they had a class in the winter with Dr. Tony Ruth. And Dr. Tony Ruth is probably one of the premier cat biologists in the United States. And she had done her second, the second study in Yellowstone National Park. So there'd been three studies in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the last one just uh, concluded. And her study was around 1998 to 2005. And uh, she was looking at wolf and cougar interactions, how the, what, how the wolves had affected the cougars that were there because they had just been brought back. So she was giving a presentation and, uh, sorry, a class and I was able to go to that class. And in that class, I, uh, I learned a lot of things but one of the things I learned the most about that really helped me in my tracking was what a scrape was. And uh, unfortunately I can't, uh, can't view everybody here and see how many people know what a scrape is, but um, I'm going to show you what a scrape is. So one of the things that uh, I found when I was uh, following uh, cougar tracks is that, uh, first of all, they're really difficult to follow because cougars are ambush predators. So they're not just uh, running on trails like you might find coyotes uh, or wolves or bears. They like to use our human trails. Um, so it's pretty athletic following a cougar. And a lot of times when I followed them, they'd end in a mess of wolf tracks. So in this next video, I want you to, the first scene you're gonna see is a, is a mountain lion making a scrape. So what is a scrape? So basically a male mountain lion makes a scrape and you'll see this mountain lion making it with his back legs and kind of sh sort of shuffling them back and forth. And he makes an impression in the dirt, which is probably about 11 or 12 inches long. And cats are visual creatures. So that's really important for them to have that visual cue. And usually, at least in my area where there's snow in the winter, they're gonna wanna find, because they're visual creatures, they're gonna wanna find a place that there's less snow. And so you usually find these under large trees. So like in my area, we have large Douglas burrs. You might find them under that. Um, okay, so let's uh, move. Oh, um, and why do they make <laughs> scrapes? So um, there's, of course, we don't know all the reasons because we don't have very good smellers. But um, one reason they make scrapes is to tell other males uh, that uh, this is my territory and move on. 
And of course, another reason is to find females. Males have very large territories that usually encompass two to three females. And they can, they can have 200 mile territories. So you kind of wonder how do they find each other when uh, a female comes into estrus. So this may be one of the ways. Um, they make them along their corridors where they travel, travel corridors. And cougars usually circle back. So they may circle back to that area every 10 to, days to two weeks. So they're kind of making them in their area. And the other thing is just to, um, they're kind of like a signpost for other animals. So in this video, you're going to see a, cougar, a male making a scrape. And then you're also going to see a female come approaching it. But you're going to see a lot of other animals visiting that site. That's a female coming. Oh, there's a grizzly bear messing with the camera, just to clarify. Okay, so just to um, clarify that, all these videos I'm going to show you the next, this last series, this series, and there'll be another one. They're all taken at the same scrape site tree. So it just different seasons. Um, in this next video, you're going to see kind of one of the main reasons why cougars make scrapes.
Okay, in this uh, next video, you're gonna, you're gonna see same scrape tree. Uh, there's two kittens in the front here and you'll just watch the, the uh, adult uh, mom come around the back at the end. So you can kind of compare size. And I'm betting that these uh, kittens are probably about around four months old. Okay, and in this next video, so this is a different site, and at the very top, you can kind of see the legs of, a, of the adult mother, and you're going to watch for a couple things. There's going to be a kitten that's going to come in from the bottom right, and that kitten is about six months old, so you're going to kind of check out how big it is. I want you to watch where the kitten walks. The other thing about this video is it's actually a rock cave. And um, so I had my camera on this cave for about a year and every single animal you can think of visited that site. So cougars are not too wild about using caves for their kittens. And I probably after seeing that wouldn't advise anybody to sleep in one. <laughs> So after I took that video and then I uh, visited Tony Roos class and a biologist told me that cat was about six months old, born in September, I got really curious. That cat looks really big to me. How long do kittens actually stay with their mother? So in this next video, um, which is not my video, it's, um, I probably could never get a video like this. This is a study that's being done in California by Quentin Martins at the Audubon Canyon Ranch. And he has, uh, that's in Sonoma County, and he has a few uh, collared cats. And he was able to, uh, because he knew where the, the cougars were, the mothers were, he was able to get a camera in a den site. So this video you're going to see, these, uh, these are newborn kittens and they can't open their eyes yet. So cougars are born, uh, kittens are born blind and um, their ears are closed as well. And they, you can see you can, they're barely able to move. So when a mother is going to choose a den site, she's not uh, creating a, a den like a, a wolf or uh, might do or a, a bear. She's not digging anything. Basically, she's looking for a place that's really kind of hard to get into. So she might choose kind of a rock talus. She might choose a, a super brushy um, site down here in the desert might be something with a bunch of thorns and everything. So predators can't get in. Um, so where I live, we have a lot of down trees. That's a great uh, site for uh, cougars to choose. They're not, usually it's not they never do. I've seen them in, um, in caves, but as I said, everything visits a cave, so it's not a great site. But uh, the cubs are born blind and with their ears closed, and then they weigh little more than a pound, and usually there's about two to four kittens in a litter. And the, um, the 
let's see, within two weeks, their ears and eyes open. Of course, their eyes are sky blue for a while and they have those spots. And they begin exploring those makeshift dens. Then about four weeks, the kittens start engaging in mock play and they start venturing out to explore their surroundings. But by eight to 12 weeks, they're weaned and they're on the move with their mom. And they're very agile at that point, but they can't climb trees till they're about five or six months old. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll go with their mom while she's out in her territory. Um, but when she goes to actually hunt, she'll stash her kitten somewhere and then she'll go kill her prey. Then she'll go back and get her kittens and bring them to uh, feed. But at that point is probably the most vulnerable time for kittens because they can't climb trees and then uh, predators are attracted to the smell of, of her kill. So that's a real vulnerable time for them. But by, uh, but by six months old, they're, a, you know, they're, they're more agile able to climb trees. But kittens will stay with their mom for anywhere from 18 to 24 months. So that seems like an awfully long time. Those cats you know, can get pretty big by the time they're a year. But actually, if there, something happens to their mother, if she's killed by a hunter or she gets in an accident or something, uh, if they're under a year old, probably they won't survive. They just don't have the hunting skills yet. And even um, at nine months old, they may not even have fully erupted their canines. So there's a video, it's probably still you can watch, that Dr. Mark Elbrock did in the Panthera study, which is on CatWatch, um, and Nat Geo CatWatch online. And that video shows uh, a, a mother with two kittens who are a year old, and she brings them a wounded fawn and gives it to them to practice on. And that's not uncommon. Um, but you watch these youngsters, they're, over, they're a year old at that point, and they really can't figure out how to deliver a killing blow. It's almost kind of like watching your you know, house cat play with a mouse. But finally, after about five or six minutes, one of them figures it out and, and does that. So, so I'm gonna uh, give you a, just take a little segue for a moment and show you so, if you remember those two kittens that were um, about four months old in the snow under that tree, this is the same cat uh, a little later and probably about nine months old. And I want you to listen to, um, you'll, you, the cat gets pretty close to the camera, so I want you to listen to what um, you hear. Uh, cats make a lot of uh, whistles and purrs and they're kind of communication calls, usually moms and kittens. So sort, of, sort of like bird calls. Okay, so back to these kittens. So somewhere around um, 18 to 24 months, uh, her kittens will disperse. And it could be a little earlier. You, you hear about kittens dispersing at 14 months. Um, but Dr. Mark Elbrock, he was heading up the Jackson uh, Cougar study, which lasted for 16 years, it just completed in 2017. So he got interested in what makes cats disperse? Why do kittens disperse? So here's a series he took, and this is M, stands for male, M80, and he's probably about 15 months there. You can see how big he is. He's on top of his mother, who is F61, and she's collared, F for female. And F61 has found the only dry spot there, and he wants it. Um, so he's kind of on top of her and trying to get it. And lo and behold, he does get it. And she kind of cuffs him and bites him. And so basically, I mean, he wrote a paper, but in a nutshell, his conclusion was kind of just like your teenagers. It's like, oh, so annoying, get them out of the house. And then of course the teenagers want to get out of the house too. And usually around that, sometimes around that time, um, the mother might get pregnant again. And then she definitely wants um, to get, her, her kittens kicked out. So what happened to M80? So M80 did disperse on April 1st and he was 19 months old at the time. 
And he, um, so what happens when cougars disperse? So first of all, females, they don't need to go that far usually. They try if they can to set, set up, if there's an empty space, they'll set up shop by their mothers. They don't have very large territories, but a male, he's carrying the genetic diversity for um, the lineage. And so he needs to, to get away from his father, of course, his father's um, territory, which could be large. And then he has to avoid other ma resident males and get beyond to find his own empty territory and hopefully an empty territory where there's some females. So M80 actually went 200 miles. He went from the Jackson area uh, all the way to Butte, Montana. And he did find a, a spot that he set up shop. And, uh, but unfortunately at 24 months uh, around Thanksgiving, he was killed by a hunter. So there are um, males really have a really difficult time when they disperse. So not only do they have to avoid other resident males and they have to avoid hunters, but roads. Um, and uh, they also are the ones, usually if you see a, uh, a cougar in town, that's usually a disperser, just trying to figure out where to go. Uh, usually if you hear about um, a, a cougar that's killed some goats, or chickens or uh, something small, that's usually a disperser. So usually when a, a cat is dispersing, they're still, they know how to hunt, but they're not, it's, it's, it's a whole thing to kill a deer and not get hurt. So they're gonna kind of concentrate more on smaller prey until they get their territory set up. And then they're usually um, switching over more to deer. So they may even uh, be, uh, hunting skunks, porcupines, something like that, or, or your local cats. Okay, in this next video, same tree. So it is a really fertile tree, as you can see. It's a good scrape tree. So this is going to be uh, two dispersers or siblings. And um, sometimes that happens. The, the siblings will disperse together, but then eventually they'll, they'll peel off to find their own territories. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a personal story. Um, this is around the valley where I live. And um, once a year, I usually like to hike up. I, I just, this, this uh, mountain doesn't really have a name. I just call it Far Cry Mountain. And uh, it has some old uh, Indian relics way, way up high called Sheep Eater Traps, where um, actually the uh, native peoples in our valley used to hunt bighorn sheep. And they're very high up, of course, where the sheep were. And I like to um, usually go once a year and hike way up there. So this was, um, there wasn't too much snow. Obviously, there's a south facing slope, but it was early April, so it was still cold. And I had my dog and we took a hike way up there. And you can see where my hike destination is quite high. And we are almost at that destination. It's sort of a series of uh, benches and plateaus. So you're going up from one plateau and then hiking up to another plateau. And we get up to almost the highest plateau. And then my dog uh, kind of, he obviously wants to go up the scree into something else. And I thought, well, there's usually when he wants to go somewhere, there's something interesting up there. So it was easy for him to climb up that scree, but for me, 
you know, I'm, I'm kind of crawling up there. And we get up to a small little uh, platform or bench that is oh, maybe no bigger than a, a, a kitchen or something, you know, it's very small. And I'm climbing up there and I see there's something up there that attracted his attention that was dead. And I'm thinking, oh, I did this whole thing and there's probably, you know, remains of a deer or something. But lo and behold, it wasn't a deer, it was actually a dead cougar. So um, you can still see there's snow around it it was cold and that that cougar uh all it had was you can see by its teeth it was young and its eyes were pecked out by the birds but other than that it was completely intact and that area is way too high for a hunter to kill it um it just wouldn't have happened um and it you know i so i thought i had some thoughts about what was going on but i looked around the bench and i i saw this which is a typical cat kill. So I don't know if any of you have seen what a cat kill looks like, but um, basically like all cats are very, very neat. Um, and so this is a real typical remains of a cat kill where you just sort of see the circle of fur left of the deer and barely anything left. Maybe there's a little bit of leg left. Um, cougars don't have carnassials, so they can't like crunch up bones in the same way that maybe a, a bear or a, a wolf could. Um, so, oh, the other thing about cougar kills, which is quite interesting, is if you pick up that fur and look at it, it looks like um, somebody cut it with a scissors. And that's because they use uh, their front teeth and they kind of got I don't know, bite it or somehow they're able to look, <laughs> they're not tearing it. Like if it was a, uh, a canine kill, uh, it's sort of a mess, things are all over and they just pull the, the fur out and usually some skin comes with it. So I had thoughts about what might've happened, but I wasn't sure of course. And I also um, volunteer for the local museum. So I have a permit that allows me to pick up, I could have picked up that skull and I had a knife in my pocket and taken it back to the museum. But I didn't want to do that because I didn't have all the proper equipment. And I knew about a man named Eric York who was, had been working in the Grand Canyon um, because of the research that I'd done. So Eric, he was a biologist working on large carnivores in the Grand Canyon and particularly cougars. And he had several females collared and he got a mortality signal on one of his GPS collars. So he went out to check out what was going on and he found his cougar that was dead, but it was completely intact. It wasn't obvious, no predator had killed it. It hadn't gotten in a fight. He wasn't sure what it, why it died. So he took the cougar body and he brought it back to his garage and he was gonna do an autopsy. And of course, Eric is a biologist, he knows what he's doing. So he opened up that cougar in his garage and while he, when he did that, a whole bunch of invisible spores came out. And that night he felt ill and he went to bed and three days later he was dead. Well, what killed Eric was the plague. So cougars do get the plague and I think you guys know that in the Southwest, but they also found out and they didn't really know this, but cougars in Yellowstone study and in the Jackson study have the plague. So we have the plague up there too. Cougars are opportunist, opportunistic and they'll eat rodents which can carry the plague. And the plague um, for, uh, for us humans, it, it, if, we, if I opened him up, that would, and he had the plague, I didn't know that, it, uh, those spores reside in the lungs. So um, I certainly didn't want to do that without a mask and gloves, proper equipment. So I went back down, got the proper equipment. It's a hard hike, so it was maybe a month or two later. I get up there and um, bring the skull. We process it at the museum, and that's what it looks like. So what killed that cougar was another cougar. The resident male killed that cougar. So that was a dispersing male, young male. And uh, interestingly enough, his tail was quite short, the dead cougar. I think he probably had had frostbite when he was little. And you can see the puncture wounds there. So he, he probably smelled some something to eat, dead deer. 
came through and there was the resident male and they got into a fight and he did not win. So you can see that um, it's quite dangerous for dispersing males to make it. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little video and I'm gonna kind of apologize. I wanted to put this in because I really liked it. It's actually a series of photos um, and this cougar sat there, same tree, um, for about 45 minutes. And I, the, my camera is a little on the, on the high side there, but I wanted to show it to you because he sat there and he basically cleaned himself just like a house cat might. It's just kind of fun to watch. And you can see what he does at the end. So cougars are really curious, um, just like cats. And um, in terms of trail camera work, there you can see that cougar sat there for almost an hour and he knew the camera was there the whole time and he really didn't care. Um, you can actually use a flash on them. They don't care, but um, just about any other animal does, doesn't like flash. Certainly, you know, wolves, bears, uh, Coyotes, they don't like flash. Um, they don't really even like trail cameras. I so in this next video, you're gonna see a, a cougar making a scrape from the back. And usually what they do is, um, most of the time it seems like sometimes they'll defecate on the scrape, but most of the time they just urinate on the scrape. And if you look close, you can actually see this male urinating on the scrape. And then you're gonna see a male bobcat come in and he's gonna make a scrape. Um, he must be a pretty tough bobcat to make a scrape on top of the, the cougar's uh, scrape. And then you'll see a female bobcat come in and check it all out. There he is, it's urinating.
So I wanted to get into a little bit of the latest science, but before I do, um, when I started out doing this, of course, I wanted to learn a lot more about cougars and science, but I did a lot of interviews, probably over 50 interviews, with a lot of different types of people who would have close up and personal knowledge of cougars. Um, since they're such a secretive animal, we can't just go and watch them in the park or something. So um, I, at the end of every interview, I always ask them, what do you think is sort of the character, the essence of a cougar? Um, and a lot of the biologists said to me, oh, they're kind of like your house cat, kind of like you just saw when that cougar was sitting there for 45 minutes. But I um, also talked to other people. And one of the people I talked to um, told me a very interesting story. And his name is Matt Nelson. Matt Nelson is a professional tracker. And he's worked with um, Mark Elbrock on several studies several cougar studies. So he is working on a cougar study in Colorado. And he told me a story that I'm gonna to read to you from my book um, about a cat. So I asked Nelson the same burning question I'd asked many of my interviewees. Do you have a sense of the essence of a mountain lion? He replied, I think all that we've learned and all that we see with this technology is only a scratch in the surface of what a cat really is. Nelson's answered my question with a story of one cougar followed in the Colorado Garfield Mesa study. A female lion left her kittens in one spot and traveled straight down the mountain. Her journey took her 10 miles up and over steep terrain and when she finally arrived at her destination, she immediately made a kill. She didn't veer off her trail, she didn't tarry, but she walked a straight line. She fed for a while, then walked directly back to gather her kittens and brought them to the kill site to feed. I got to thinking about it, Nelson told me. What's the motivation here? Why did that cat just be lying? There were all kinds of game and tracks and other animals in the area but she walked through, that she walked through, but she went straight over there for some reason and made this kill. Even with all our technology, we can't understand that at all. Is there a mystical aspect there? Did she pick up something off the landscape that said, there's an animal on the other side of the mountain that needs to be killed? Or was she just merely walking? I have no idea. We can see where she went and what she did with our technology but as far as understanding of the animal, in my opinion, we can't understand that motivation through science. And so with that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the science. So the first thing we need to talk about is um, how do you find out about cougars? Well, our technology has improved so much. We used to use telemetry um, collars and with a telemetry collar, you probably know this, but you basically, don't get real-time information. You've got to go out into the field. Um, you've got to uh, take an antenna with you and you've got to get a beep on that collar and you've got to triangulate it. So you've got to get a beep from several places and then triangulate it on a map. But now we have GPS collars and we can program those collars to give us um, download information exactly where that cat is in real time, every 20 minutes, every hour, whatever, uh, the biologist wants to do. So that's given us a lot more information. We're learning a lot more. Um, so how do you do that? So that's Dr. Malk Elbrock there. And I think I might've said he's um, considered the Indiana Jones of cougar research and he's with a kitten. So um, the first method would be snow tracking. So snow tracking sounds fairly easy and basically it's done with um, trained dogs and uh, with someone called a houndsman and these dogs are extremely well trained they don't what's called run trash which is like you put them on a fresh track you have to turn them in the right direction because they don't know they can smell a cougar track but they don't know which direction the cat went um, and they won't veer off and you know run after a deer track or anything and so basically you just, uh, the, you know, on a snowmobile or on foot, then the researchers uh, follow the, the, 
the uh, dogs. The dogs have GPS collars on them too, and they can tell when they treat a cat because the cat is standing in one place. So that sounds kind of easy, but I'm going to read you um, a story from the uh, from the Jackson study, and um, just it's not so easy following cougars. So. Michelle Pezio, uh, PTCP, that's Panthera Teton Cougar Project, PTCP's manager told me how she, Elbrock, Houndsman Boone Smith, and team biologist Connor O'Malley went out on a winter capture, fully expecting to be back in time for lunch at the office. The line was on a kill 200 meters away from an easy snowmobile ride 30 miles from the main road. F49 was high up in the Grovant Mountains with a failing collar that needed to be changed. With the scheduled winter road closures just days away, the team was under pressure to get the job done. As they rode higher, the snow deepened and it was very apparent there was no game at this altitude. The line was living with her six month old kittens near the headwaters of the Grovant range. With little food available, the crew wondered what she was doing there. The capture crew parked their sled near the kill site and began their trek on foot. The dogs located the family's whereabouts. They circled in only to find that the family had killed a porcupine. Not a clean kill, it was a mess. There was stuff everywhere. The capture crew successfully treed the mother and one kitten. Her second kitten was dead with more than 300 porcupine quills in it. At six months, it should be hitting about 35 pounds maybe a little bigger if it were a male, Smith told me, adding to the story. And this little cat was obviously not. I believed it weighed in about 15 pounds. By the time the crew got the mother collared, it was dark with a storm rolling in. And with all the circling and weaving during the chase, one of their three dogs was now missing. Peziola and Elbrock hiked back to the sled while Smith and O'Malley went to find the missing dog. The men followed the dog's tracks until a blizzard began raging, covering his tracks. All Smith could hope for now was that the dog had settled down for the night in a safe place where wolves wouldn't find them. Separated, each team independently realized they needed to spend the night and each built a fire to stay warm. By 3 a.m., Elbrock became concerned that his office staff would be worrying about them. With almost zero visibility, he and Peziol found the snowmobile and headed for the truck parked on the highway. As Elbrock drove through the blizzard, Peziol clung to Elbrock with one hand and to the dead kitten with the other. In an instant, the trail took a sharp turn, plunging the snowmobile into a giant snowbank and sending Peziol flying through the air holding the porcupine laden kitten. With a lot of effort, they righted the snowmobile and made it back to the trailhead. After a few hours of sleep in the truck, Elbrock returned for Smith and O'Malley. He found the errant dog on the road east of where they had been caught F-49 wallowing in four feet of snow. So you can see that's not so easy. And now um, I'm gonna tell you about another collaring method and that's done in a wildland urban interface area. Um, and I'm gonna kind of read a story to you first. This comes from Santa Cruz area. So Santa Cruz is probably has in Northern California, the longest running study. Uh, I think it's been going on since 2008. And I, I don't know how many of you know that area, Northern California, Santa Cruz, um, but it's um, right near the coast, but it's, uh, in a, it's a, basically a redwood forest with very deep ravines. The ravines are dark. Um, there's uh, interspersed dotted with uh, people living in there that have you know, livestock and goats. Um, but there's also public lands there. And uh, there's a lot of poison oak when, you, when you're going through that, those ravines. So they can't run dogs there, otherwise they're gonna have those dogs chasing cats that are running through people's backyards. So that's not gonna work. So what do they do? So basically they use a, a baited cage. Uh, you can kind of see this is a, uh, there's gonna be a video. So it's a little hard to see right now. That, so there's a baited cage at the bottom there. And then there's, you can see the cougar up there but there's a cougar inside that baited cage. So 
they'll set up a trail camera. And when that baited cage triggers, there's some kind of a, a beep for them. And usually, of course, it's in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. And then they have to go out there right away because they have to process that cougar and get them out as fast as they can. Um, and like I said, it's going to be dark. It's going to be difficult um, and uh, quite wet. So I'll read you a story from uh, Ivan, uh, Veronica Ivanovich, who was on that, on that crew. The study team was having trouble catching a particular cat in an area when finally they had success. The beacon had gone off and it was a sub-adult male in the trap. This was a predispersal age cat and we were really excited to get a collar on him because once you put a collar on, you can see where they go and that kind of information is really hard to come by. With the cat drugged and the crew working, their flashlights revealed eye shine lurking in the shadows. The crew presumed the mother cat was watching as they worked on her son. Ivanovich paint, pauses to paint a picture of the scene for me. It's 3 a.m., pitch black in deep redwoods, a mountain lion's watching them, and they are uneasy and out of their element in the darkness. You could look around and one minute the shine would be coming from over here. You'd wait for a few minutes and you'd see the eye shine coming from the other side, but you couldn't hear anything moving. You could only tell from the eye shine that the cat was circling and probably not too pleased. The cat never approached the crew. They finished working on the young male, released him and left the area with their gear. Back at the office, when they checked the camera card, they had a big surprise. Mom was actually the subadult's brother. Apparently, the mother had left the two big kittens while she hunted. The camera video told the rest of the story. As Ivanovich explained, newly collared 41M went in the trap, steps on the trigger, the cage door closes behind him. He startles at first, then turns around and looks at the deer in front of him like, sweet, okay, I got dinner. He lies down and starts eating. About a minute later, his brother jumps on the trap and starts playing and pawing at him through the bars like, hey, what are you doing in there? I'm gonna poke you with my paws. Ivanovich startles me with her next bit of information, which brought her tail full circle. Later on, we caught 41M's brother, 46M as well. Wait, I think, I read about that cat. This is a saga of 46M, the lion who dispersed blindly into the city of Mountain, of Mountain View, was humanely caught and was released back into the Santa Cruz mountains. What happened to 46M after they moved him back to the mountains? Did he disperse successfully? Unfortunately, 46M later got hit by a car and died. Most carnival biologist stories are going to have a sad ending. You follow these animals for a while and too many of them end with the focal character getting shot or hit by a car. So, I'm going to show you that video now that she was talking about. And so you just kind of have to watch closely. It's, it's kind of not a great video from a trail camera, but you can see the, the cage and you're going to see that cat, his brother on top, kind of goofing around with him. Okay, and finally, what, what happens in um, a place probably like around here in a desert environment? So Logan and Sweener did a 10 year study over in New Mexico and they tried using a houndsman with dogs. That would seem like the most logical, easy way to do it. But they found that because the area is so rugged and just has so many cliffs that um, cats were so there weren't any trees the cats the dogs would find the cats and be barking at them but then the cats would just uh, get away really easily where dogs couldn't go and they even lost uh one of their dogs fell off a cliff so what they did was they used um snares which i think are probably more what happens in a desert environment and they used padded snares 
And you, you literally have to put out um, like hundreds of these snares and it's very intensive work because you've got to check your snares every day. So um, that's, a, that's another way that's done. Okay, so a little bit about some of the science. So I think some of the most fascinating new information that's come out about uh, mountain lions is what was done by M Dr. Mark Elbrock in the Jackson study. And uh, he, he's written papers on this. So um, somewhere about 2011, and this was or 2010, something like that, before Dr. Elbrock came on the study, or maybe it was close to when he was coming on the study, um, there was two females with uh, two kittens each that um, were sort of in the same area. And in the Jackson area, when they do this, they do their studies in the winter in snow and the elk move in and the deer move out. And instead of the, you know, cats following the deer, they just stay there and then they start preying on elk. So those are pretty big kills. So what they were finding is they were finding these two females that had kittens were sharing kills. So they were big kills. So they were sharing them together. And um, they, you know, at that time they just had telemetry collars. So they assumed that these, ki these two um, moms were sis siblings. That's what they thought. When Dr. Elbrock went in the study in 2011, 2012, he changed out every single one of those telemetry collars to GPS collars. So then he had a lot better information. So what he could do is he could, uh, first of all, when he changed them out, he was able to collect bl blood and uh, samples, but also he could put his cameras up right away. So he got a um, lot more information. As soon as there was a kill, it would show that a cougar was staying there for a period of time and then they could hike out to that spot in just a few hours and put cameras up. And what he found that was these two uh, female cats with kittens, they were not related at all. In fact, one of them had come in, they were both about four years old and they had kittens that were about the same age. Um, but one of them had come in from a completely different area that they didn't know at all. Um, and so uh, he also found that the female, the male that um, was the resident male in that territory was also feeding with them. So they were sharing their kills sometimes, not only with each other, the, uh, the two um, females in that area that had a territory, but they were also sharing it with their male. Um, and so over time in his research, what he found was that resident males basically are like um, the uh, kings of a fiefdom there. So he called each, uh, com he called them communities and those communities are circumscribed by the resident male. So for instance, in this little diagram that's so simple, each one of those C's or communities would be a resident male with his females inside. And then each uh, whole thing would be, he called a network. Um, so let's say a mountain top might have three, four, five of these communities of little fiefdoms that have, um, you know, their resident males. So the resident males are basically they all, and it's kind of like your your neighbors. You know your neighbors, but maybe you're not, you know, you say hi. Maybe you're not socializing with them, but you know them, and you're kind of friendly with them. So that's all these males, the resident males that are. They maybe they overlap a little, they'll see each other, they know each other, but they kind of keep the peace there. Um, and that basically is a cougar social system. Um, so then you could imagine like if um, he actually even found there was a dispersing male that went through, a young male that was sort of starving, um, was not in good shape at all. And one of the resident males shared a kill with him. And then that disperser just moved on. So that was the that was pretty interesting. But you can imagine if one of those resident males dies through whatever means or through hunting, um, then it's going to disrupt that system. Okay, so that's a cover of my book. And um, that is a photo that was done um, by uh, let's see, it's, that's a photo that was taken of, uh, sorry, get my notes here, um, of, uh, 
M198, uh, male 198, photo was taken by um, Drew Rush, and Drew Rush works for Nat Geo. And he actually spent a year trying to take that photo. So it's not staged. Actually, I asked him that because there's an um, elk rack right there. But um, he had it on a cougar recorder, and I guess he just, you know, that was a trail camera, and he just got his perfect photo there. Um, but M198 is actually a, a famous, um, it turns out, a famous cougar. So in that photo, he's not collared, but he um, did get collared. He's a young male, and he got the first accelerometer. And um, what is an accelerometer? So first of all, a GPS collar um, gives you real time information. So you don't, you're not going out necessarily and collecting the collar. You'll get it. You'll get it downloaded to your computer. An accelerometer, though, is stay is is basically a, a Fitbit for a cougar. And it stays on the cougar with the information um, until you go and collect it. it. It'll fall off whatever the biologists want it to, maybe a year. And but it's unlike your uh, Fitbit. It's collecting like uh, 16 or 32 times a second. So how did they get? How did they figure out? It, you know what does a Fitbit do? It's basically measuring energy energy output, calories counted which is kind of the lifeblood, you know, you need calories in order to survive. So how much, you know, if you have, you're putting out too much energy and you're not consuming enough calories, you're, go, you're gonna die. So how did, but they, how did they figure it out? So for a human, it's pretty easy. We can, you know, take their heartbeat, put them on a, you know, a treadmill, but how'd they do that with a cougar? So I'm gonna just read you a short story about how they did that. So the person who's running the study or just finished the study, his uh, PhD student, Colby Anton. And he actually, this was in Yellowstone. It was a three or four year study, the last study they just completed. And he actually was a U UC Santa Cruz student. So um, the Fitbit was basically engineered, figured out at UC Santa Cruz by um, Chris Wilmers. So the other uh, person who helped him figure it out is a woman named Terry Williams. Wilmer says, energy expenditure is a lifeblood of an, of an animal. If they're burning more calories than they're consuming, they'll die. And without enough surplus calories, they'll never reproduce successfully. But in order to correlate the output of the accelerometer's data, Wilmers and Williams needed to figure out what the animal was doing that triggered the patterns the amount of oxygen any particular movement consumed and how much the collar was moving in response. Williams had done treadmill studies with wolves and even river otters, but wild cougars were a different thing. After three years of searching, she found a veterinarian named Lisa Wolf who had raised three pumas. It took 10 months and a lot of meat to train the cougars on a treadmill but once they figured it out, they were brilliant, Williams said. The collared cats were in a plexiglass enclosure, running, walking, or resting on the treadmill as a videotape was running. All the while, an oxygen analyzer measured how much oxygen they consumed during each activity. That measurement is the VO2, the correlate to calories consumed. Wilmers found that energy expenditure in cougar hunts were almost twice what he thought in other models. And lions that abandoned their ambush strategy to hunt in more open ground burned more calories. This had implication for animals living in disturbed sites where humans have altered landscapes. So an interesting story about M198 was that um, well, he, at some point, um, the, uh, he, he, he gave a mortality signal. And uh, so Col Colby Anton, who was doing the study, he went up with another biologist to figure out, of course, the GPS collar could locate where that mortality signal was. And he went up and he saw it was on a large talus slope. And of course, they wanted to get the accelerometer. So they went over and you can pretty much pinpoint from a GPS within something like three meters, you know, where, where, where that animal's gonna be. But they go there and they don't see the animal at all. 
So they're walking around on this teleslope and they just don't see a body. They don't see anything. And they're there all day and then night falls and they go back and Colby wakes up the next morning and thinks, I got to get that accelerometer. It's, it's full of all that data. And uh, so he goes back to the site and he goes to that spot and he notices that there's a very large boulder and there's kind of a crevice underneath. I um, he thinks, I wonder if it's coming, the cat crawled into that crevice and is down in there. Now, the thing you have to know about a mortality signal is it's not really saying that the cat is dead or the animal's dead. It's basically saying the animal is, is staying there and not moving. So the animal could have been injured and just lying there hurt, um, which would have been, of course, really dangerous for him to crawl in. But, you know, he took the chance and he crawled in and, and I guess, unfortunately for 198, but luckily for him, the uh, animal was dead and he, he was able to retrieve the collar. And uh, M198 was killed by another male, the resident male, uh, just sort of another story that happens quite a, a bit. Okay, so we're basically kind of almost at the end and I'm just going to show you a, a couple quick videos. So this um, was, uh, so if you remember a long time ago in the presentation, there was that uh, under that tree and snow, there was those two four month old kittens with the female. Well, I wanted to get a video of the male and I had seen that he had made a whole bunch of scrapes along this uh, very animal trail. It's like no, no human uses it. So I just put my camera there um, and it was early spring and uh, I'll show you kind of a series of videos. That's the male. Okay, this is, I think the last video and this is the resident male that I was looking for. Okay, so I'm ready to take questions, but right before I do, um, since I'm not doing this live, I usually do this part live so you can feel these skulls. And just to give you a little bit of a comparison of skull size, obviously the far right, that's a coyote, um, just to look at the morphology of it. Um, but you can see the bobcat and, and then that two to three month old cougar kitten and that cougar kitten who's only a couple months old that is way beyond the biggest bobcat skull that you're going to find and then a an, an adult kitten i mean sorry adult cougar so i'm happy to take any questions wow leslie that was fantastic this is karen talking thank you so much uh as someone who gives a mountain lion presentation regularly here in the canyon, um, I learned so, so much and, and uh, I'm grateful for all that you did today. Thank you. So we have our first question from William Couchman, Bill Couchman. Bill, go ahead, please unmute yourself. Uh, what is a scrape? What is a scrape, you said? Yes. Yeah, well, I think, I don't know if you were there for the very beginning, if you came in late. Okay, so yeah, a scrape is something that a male makes with their back legs. I showed it, uh, you can watch the video when it's when they release it. You can actually see a video of a male doing that. 
Um, and they use it to mark territory, to mark corridors, to uh, tell females that they're around where they are, um, kind of this, their calling card for other animals. Okay. Okay, Michelle, you're up. Hi, Leslie, thank you. Uh, also a question about the scrape site. You've got a wealth of uh, data just from that one scrape site. Uh, over what period of time did you collect those videos? How long did you have the trail cam there? Yeah, and I've had, I've found a, several scrape sites and I'll put videos there, but um, that particular one, well, I think I probably found that after I went to Tony Roo's class. So I went to her class and I learned about a scrape and where to look for them. Probably had read about, I think I'd read about them, but reading about it and then hearing about it directly and somebody telling you what it looks like and showing, basically what happened was in that class, they showed a video uh, of, of a scrape area. Um, and then they showed all these animals on it coming through. And they even had a grizzly bear lying on that scrape site for like half a day. So I realized it was a super gold mine for a trail camera. Um, and so then what I did is I went back home and I just started, um, I, the area I usually do this in has a lot of um, basically limber pines, which are not very big. So, and when the, then we do have dug fir. So the dug fir is where they're gonna wanna put their scrape site because then they're a big dug fir, they're not gonna get a lot of um, snow on. So I just started hunting for one and I found, found a scrape site. And now I kind of have some ideas where to look, having done this for a while. So. Okay, Catherine, you're up. Do you have a question? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was just a fabulous talk and the videos are so additive. I really appreciate it. Um, my question on the scrapes, like other cats, do mountain lions have pheromones that they're leaving in that position? And do they have the glands on their feet? That they're leaving a scent? Like usually they rub their hips or their shoulders. I can't remember where all their glands are, but I didn't know there were ones on feet. Well, I mean, I don't know, possibly. I, I mean, I'm sure that they're, you know, they're, they're urinating on them or they're defecating, but there's, um, and I, I talk about it in my book, there's a fellow who did in Mendocino um, a whole study on scrapes. And it's just, you know, too long to go into here, it's in the book, but basically what he found is that um, cats are, so he tried to like make a, urinate without a scrape, like put urine, cat urine and all that without a scrape. And then he'd make a scrape with his hand and then put cat urine or whatever. But he found that it was the visual cue that was really important. So cats are visual creatures, you know, as your cat is right there, right? So, um, you know, if you put something shiny, you know, they're attracted to it. So they're, they need that visual cue. And I'm sure they're marking it as well. And there's, uh, I'm sure their urine has, you know, scent. I, you know what? I've smelled their urine. I don't smell anything. <laughs> they're, when they defecate, you definitely smell it. It definitely has a cat smell. But um, I've smelled scrapes many times. I don't smell a thing. So that doesn't mean, because I can't smell it, doesn't mean other animals are smelling it. You saw that there was that first video, a coyote went and marked right over it. So they're all coming in through there. So they're all attracted. I don't know about, I, sorry, I don't really know that answer. I don't know if it's known if we, they have, you know, any, anything on their feet. I mean, I know bears do, they'll stomp around because they'll come to my camera and then they'll basically not, not grizzlies, but black bears, male black bears, they'll come out stomping around. So I know, you know, they use that as a marker. Thank you. Okay, Deb, you've got a question. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, wondering about the uh, feeding of the kits. Um, so there's male and female will both do a kill. I mean, when does a, do they live in the one, in one, one area all the time? And so that, that 
residence mail, uh, mail or what, what did you call it? Designated mail. Uh, does he, he doesn't provide for everybody because the females will do their own hunting. Is that correct? Yeah. So basically, interestingly enough, what Elbrock found was that males, so the females were allowing the resident male, their ma it's sort of their male, the father of those kittens, right? The resident male was allowing the resident male, the father to come and feed, but it was never the reverse. It's interesting. So if the, if the male made a kill, he wasn't, the, you know, females weren't coming. He wasn't letting the females and kittens come. So he figured there was probably, I mean, there's definitely going to be a trade-off there. There's a reason for that. Um, and mm, trying to remember what that was, um, it, you know, obviously had to do with, you know, sexuality and why, the, you know, maybe something about them coming in and allowing the mail. I don't remember, I, I really, I have to go back in the book and look, but that's one of the things he found. So that's kind of interesting that, um, that, you know, they weren't, the male was, the females weren't feeding on a male kill, just the males feeding on the female kill. But that resident male would share it with another male, with another cougar. I, I don't know if that's all the time, but they found one oh, that they that did. That one time. At least that, I mean, it, you know, there's this study only went on for like four years after Elbrock started. So, you know, and he only, he, and the, he had all those cats in that area collared, but you know, you have to, you have to do these studies for long periods of time to, to get a lot of evidence on that. But he did get, I mean, int I thought that was interesting because I think it, it may have been that that male let that other male who was starving and traveling through um, a disperser Maybe it was just like get you know a way to help them get out of there. Where did so, the dispersers go? Well, they wanted they may travel a long ways. I mean, so if you know if you read Stolzenberg's um, uh, story about you know cats that disperse from the Black Hills try to going east, those male cats will just keep going and keep going until they find female cats, which they never find. That's why there's not cats back east. Um, and usually something happens to them. They get shot, they get run over by a car or something like that. But they're looking for uh, a territory that's empty that has females in it. Thank you. Pam Roberts, please unmute yourself. Hi, Leslie. Your presentation is so wonderful and I've learned a lot and videos really help drive home the fact. On our field trips, we teach children and parents what to do if they encounter a mountain lion. But it's my understanding that, that uh, mountain lion attacks on humans would be very rare. Do you have any information about that? I can tell you they're very, very rare. I mean, I, I don't have at the tip of my tongue how many there have been, but it's they're, they're super rare. And, you know, I can just say that mountain lions have seen you if you're a hiker, then you haven't seen, you haven't probably seen them. I mean, I hike a lot in mountain lion country. I, I've been looking and tracking, you know, looking at tracks and tracking mountain lions since I moved to Wyoming in 2008. I wrote this whole book. I kind of set up my trail cameras. I know that cats are there, but the first time I ever saw a cat in my life was last spring. And I just, it was just by luck. I was hiking over a rise and I got in the area. I usually, I probably was going to check a trail camera or something. And there was a big valley meadow down below and I watched a cat emerge from the trees and just walk across the, the entire meadow um, and then about three quarters of the way he he sensed me I guess um, and then he just kind of bounded off but that was the first time I'd ever encountered one I mean I've counted grizzly bears and wolves way more than I've seen a cat so I I, I just really don't think there's if you're a runner I mean, I definitely would say don't wear headphones when you're running. That's something that I try to tell people. I mean, that action of running 
is the thing that triggers a predator, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I would also say if you have little kids, because they're right. all sort of, you know, irregular in their movement, um, they're attracting. It's just like a cat with something shiny, you know, a house cat. They're attracting that. So, you know, if you have little kids, keep them close in mountain lion country. And my neighbor actually had her dog attacked by a mountain lion. When she was inside, well, her dog was outside, they, right outside her door. They were eating dinner and they heard some funny muffled something. They went out and they found their uh, dog the, a cat had its mouth around the head oh, of, its, of their dog. And so they just started throwing rocks and yelling, and then the cat ran off. Um, so this was a young lab. Who knows, maybe the lab went over to try to play with the cat or something. But they also have a lot, a lot of deer because they um, have a horse, horse ranch there. So the deer come down, and the cat was there, attracted the deer, and then saw the dog. So... You know, if you want to scare away a cat, just look big. I mean, you know, because you teach. Yeah, teach that's people. what we teach the you know kids. Do. And um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm from Northern California. We have cats up there. We, we've had signs for since the 90s about what to do. You know, we've always, you know, and it, it's so rare you even see a cat. So if you see a cougar, I think count your blessings. Yeah. Okay. And I won't take any more of your time, Leslie. It's great, great presentation. And I can't wait to read your books. Yeah. I just wanted to say something about that. So, uh, well, you can obviously go to Amazon, um, but if you go to this place, mostly, see if I can hold up, mostly books. Um, it's, let's see, I'm going to give you the address <laughs> in Tucson. It's, hmm. You know, uh, 6208 East Speedway. So they're going to have the books tomorrow. And I like to plug local bookstores. So you can go there and get the book. Great. Thank you. And it looks like we've got one more, Leslie. So this is from Marsha. She's asked me to ask you, why did the dominant male always use the same tree for his scrape? Oh, I think it's just... Um, I don't know if he scrapes her every time, but it's part of his route. So cats are pretty predictable actually. Um, and so they'll just kind of patrol. I think they're, these males are patrolling their territory. Um, so besides eating and they, you know, they don't eat that often. So they're only um, eating, you know, every, I think 10 to 14 days, maybe longer. So they're just, you know, walking around, patrolling, seeing what's going on, making their scrape. <laughs> I'm here. I think it's kind of like that. Okay. I mean, if you if you talk to a hunter, he'll tell you, oh, that male's going to come around in another 10 days. Okay. Okay. And I have a question from myself. It's a little out of left field, but I'm wondering since you're traveling and all of the researcher uh, networks. What are you hearing these days about Canada lynx being extirpated from Wyoming? Um, I know that they're getting into Idaho and Montana perhaps a little bit, but have they been extirpated? And if not, are there any interactions between lynx and mountain lions? Uh, gosh, Canada lynx, you know, there's been lynx spotted in well, they were reintroduced into Colorado and pretty successfully. But um, I know, you know, they <laughs> they like cold and uh, we're kind of at the most southern end of their territory, actually. So kind of Yellowstone and my area is the most southern end, the Beartooth. And I know that, for instance, where I live, the Shoshone National Forest, they had a lynx plan. They had they had a somebody come out and look at habitat uh, for them, basically habitat for snowshoe hare, which is their main food. But I haven't even heard any reports of lynx. Maybe there might be some in Jackson, but um, yeah, I don't. I think I remember hearing about like one was spotted in maybe on a trail camera or in person in 2010 in Yellowstone. They're just, they're really not that many. I mean, there's, 
there's issues with them. You have to have snowshoe hair, but um, I think a lot of things that disrupt um, their, ha their winter habitat is that uh, there's roads for snowmobile roads being you know, put in. Um, and then coyotes can use those. And coyotes use the same road, so they'll eat snowshoe hares. Yeah, okay, okay, just curious. Thanks for that. So unless there are any other questions, I'm gonna turn this over to Cheryl who will wrap up. Thanks, Leslie. Leslie, again, it's wonderful. I've read, read the book. And by the way, we have the book in our library once you all <laughs> ever have an opportunity to get back to the visitor center, we actually have that. Along with that, Leslie has brought some great brochures uh, from the Mountain Lion Foundation. We will try to leave them outside the visitor center where uh, the, the bookstore occasionally has stuff out there. And there's also uh, a brochure about children and cougars from the Cougar Foundation. Leslie can correct me on this if I'm not saying it right, but that oh, might be very helpful too. And um, maybe what I could do, if the bookstore will agree, I can take some of that uh, material over there on the mostly books. And by the way, it's at the uh, Monterey Center, which is uh, Wilmot and Speedway next to Beyond Bread. It's a good place to be. And our next session will be January 11th about Bats of Sabino Canyon by Debbie Rutscher. So we look forward to seeing you then at 1.30. January 11th. And again, Leslie, thank you so much and good luck with what you're researching here with the bigghorn. We'll wait to hear more from you.